This is the Wapak Area Public Library's Lunch and Learn. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Wapaka Library. I'm just going to get started a little bit earlier. Um, there's a couple of things I want to share with you. First of all, there's a plug sticking up out of the floor, so please be very careful. We don't want anybody to trip on that. Um, we can always plug it back in, but we don't want anybody to fall, so be careful around that obstacle. And we don't have a helper, a staff helper right now. We, of course, have volunteers who help every time, and I'm so thankful. But I just decided to go ahead and serve lunch a little bit early. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. So just the few announcements that I have for you. We do have hearing loop technology in the room. So if you have a hearing aid that works on that system, you can connect it, turning it on. Um, please silence your cell phones so that we don't have any interruptions in our program today. And if you need help knowing how to silence or turn down your volume, I can help you. I'll be in the back. I do ask for help with stacking our chairs when we're done. If you're able and willing to help stack those chairs, I would greatly appreciate it. And I thank you for your free will donation. We have a donation box on that back table by the door, and those donations go to the Friends of the Library. And they're so generous every time that it covers our lunch. So I thank you very much for that. So this is the first of our Lunch and Learn series, so be sure to get the schedule. All of our schedules are printed upstairs. We have the movies started last week. So we have our, our first Thursday movie series going. And last, earlier in the year, we tried a wellness series. And we had an organization that came and gave four presentations for us. And we're branching off of that. And we're going to do a For Your Health series. And that starts on Thursday. So this Thursday at 6 PM. And we're going to do kind of alternative ideas about health. So this week, we're going to have Roots Holistic Healing. And they're going to come and talk about what is holistic health. And how is it different from average medical, which medical is never average. It's always superior. But I just want to tell you that she is my holistic doctor. I just recently um, met her and had some testing done, and it has really made me a stronger and more well person. And she has a wonderful opinion of allowing the doctors to do what they're skilled at, and her approach complementing that. So it's a very uh, positive approach, and so she'll be here Thursday night to explain her organization and what they can do. We also have in this series uh, CBD oil, presentation, a presentation on kombucha, and a presentation on ins essential oils. So you can get that schedule upstairs, and those are Thursday evenings at 6 p.m., once a month. We also have an author series, so we'll have three authors coming. That starts in October. You can look for that schedule. And we have an Instant Pot class coming up in October. So if you've ever wondered if you should get an Instant Pot, or if you have one and you don't know how to use it, Instant Pots are great and they're a little bit scary. So Nancy is going to help us learn about Instant Pots, OK? That'll be on a Saturday, October 12th. So we have a really packed schedule this fall. Look for our new adult programs coordinator, because she'll be replacing me. I'll be training her next month, or him, whoever we hire. And uh, that's an exciting change happening here at the library. So I'm not going anywhere. I'll still be here for you. Um, and I'll be a girl of our, all trades upstairs. So, But we're about to get started with our presentation. And we're going to learn about running marathons, which is something I'm sure all of you have dreamed about in your lives. There it goes. Hi, I'm Jim Anderson. Is this thing, is it working, I hope? Yeah, yeah. okay, okay, see, I don't know. Uh, I ran a marathon in every state. Uh, there's one for each state on there, 50 of them. Even, there's a couple more because I did Washington, D.C. and I, well, there's stories, we won't go too far. Then I did one in all the provinces of Canada and the Yukon and Northwest Territory. And Australia, Cancun, I did a nighttime marathon. But uh, that was unique. I'll just say it that way. At any rate, I'm starting in a little town in North Dakota called Medora. And if you've ever been to the Badlands of North Dakota, this is the place that I started. And the reason I was there, there was a challenge. They had a 105 mile mountain bike race through the Badlands. So I came out there, and then I met this gentleman. And it's been said to me, um, he doesn't look much like a biker or a runner, and 
Someone else said, how old are you? Uh, we know who this is, right? Yep, Teddy Roosevelt. And he had a ranch out there. In fact, he had two ranches. And uh, they have an imitator who is excellent out there, and this is him. And we were having a discussion. At any rate, Teddy Roosevelt made this statement that kind of fits what I try to do. It's not the critic who counts. The credit belongs to the man in the arena whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood, who strives valiantly, who knows the great enthusiasms, devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and at worst if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. So that, that's my motto. And uh, that's my support team, my wife Denise, my dog Dexter. Uh, yeah. And here we go. Um, I'm this, I picked some of the marathons I did. I didn't do all. I didn't look for like a city marathon in particular. I looked, this is on the Chisholm Trail in Kansas, uh, in Abilene. And it was a little cooler than normal that day. We ran 13 miles out on the highway, which was the Chisholm Trail. 13 miles back. Dwight Eisenhower's library and museum is across the street from here. So it's a lot going on there. And there was a 20 mile an hour wind and a temperature about 20 degrees. And the problem was I got to the first aid station, went to drink my water, and nothing came out of the cup. It was frozen. And on the way back, even though we had a 20 mile an hour wind in the face, at least we had a horse escort. So it was kind of nice. Uh, the Hatfield McCoy Marathon. And it starts in, Kansas, or in Kentucky and goes across into West Virginia. Dance Hatfield with the long white beard. Randall McCoy with the suspenders and me in the middle. Uh, they did an excellent job of reenacting the, the feud the night before. The race, we ran right through feud country where all the events took place. Ended up in Davidson, uh, West Virginia. And uh, the Hatfields and McCoys have a big celebration that weekend. A tug of war, better at shooting at each other. The Hatfields on the right side, the McCoys on this side. McCoys did better this time. Uh, down in North Carolina in July, it actually wasn't too, it was only got up to 70 degrees. This is Boone, uh, North Carolina, Grandfather Mountain. Um, we started on Appalachian State's uh, football field and made our way up the mountain at least halfway. And the interesting thing about North Carolina, there's more people of Scottish descent than there than in Scotland. And they were having a big, big celebration on Murray Field here. There are 140 clans represented. And we ran right in front of them on that track. And they were doing the caber throw and other Scottish games in the center. Uh, down in Arizona, I did uh, in Prescott. It was called the Whiskey Row Marathon. Uh, this, there were five blocks of saloons here back in the 1880s and 90s. Virgil Earp was even the sheriff here at a couple different times. So we ran right down um, Whiskey Row up into the high country. You can see the, on the inset, it was from 5,000 to 7,000 and back down again. It's a pretty neat uh, event. Uh, Taos, New Mexico, I did their marathon. I started, we started outside the Pueblo. This is wh where the Pueblo Indians... Uh, Longest continuously lived in village of its sort in the world. The blue mountains in the background was, were sacred to them. Uh, we ran for our 26 miles at 7,000 feet outside the Pueblo and finished in downtown Taos at Kit Carson Park. That was his home too. Uh, I tried, this is my brother, but that's, that's not the point. I had tried an ultra marathon, which is anything over 26 miles. This one was 33. It's on Jay Mountain in Vermont. Um, they had a lot of rain for two weeks, so it, they had to extend the times. It was, a, it was kind of unorganized, but nevertheless, we had to run through uh, 11 miles of mud that was up to knee deep. We had to uh, run in uh, mountain streams where for a mile at a shot with the, with the current and against it, and uh, under a, uh, um, a bridge. It was, it was quite an event. I didn't get to finish it. I made it through mile 25. In fact, at one point, they had a beaver pond there. You know, beaver ponds are not exactly clean water. You'd be, you'd be hiking through it, be knee deep, and all of a sudden, poof, you're down chest deep, and you never knew. But they had flags to show your way. It was a neat event. I was hoping to come back the next year to finish it, but I had this plantar fasciitis that uh, summer, so it wasn't the best, but another time. Crater Lake, Oregon. Uh, at 7,000 feet, we ran around the rim of that. 
that was that was the marathon, so it was kind of neat. Um, and the the uh, part of it was right over. Here. I don't know if I can get that. Right over there, at the bottom, of that was a finish line. Problem was that was only mile 22, so they made us run for two miles on a logging road up the next mountain and back down for the finish. So we got our exercise that day. Neat place. And in Washington, along the Strait of Juan de Fuca, uh, did the Discovery Trail Marathon uh, from Squim over to Port Angeles. Um, nice area. Coming into the finish line of Port Angeles, they announced my name, which is nor normal stuff. But then, this young lady, she heard my name. 2,000 miles away, we grew up together half a mile apart. And I had been running back and forth with her son and had no idea. And then we all had a reunion at the finish line. So that was kind of unique. Uh, in Wyoming, I did the Running with the Wild Horses Marathon um, and uh, in Green River. I uh, never saw a wild horse while I was there, but they were there. Uh, and then we ran for 20 miles up in the high country, down and across. This is where George, uh, John Wesley Powell started his journey down into the Grand Canyon. He started on the Green River and worked his way through. And this is where we had our marathon. So it, worked pretty, it was a pretty neat event. Uh, switching across the country. This is Acadia, Maine. Uh, uh, it was called the Desiree, uh, Mount Desert Island Marathon in Bar Harbor. Uh, nice day, nice place. Um, Samuel D. Jehem Plain discovered it in 1608. Couldn't see the trees and such from his ship, so he called it Desert Island. He thought it was all rock. Next day, it wasn't quite as sunny in downtown Bar Harbor, but uh, good running weather. And we ran uh, in and out of the fjords along the um, coastline and over to Southwest Harbor, and a neat event. And next door, I did the New Hampshire Marathon in Bristol um, around Newfound Lake, so uh, not far away. And whoops, too much. There, there's uh, Florida, that's um, called the Space Coast Marathon. And on Cocoa Beach, uh, across the way is Cape Canaveral, called it the uh, Space um, Marathon. And so my wife did the half marathon, so we had a picture taken with an astronaut before we left. Up to New York, didn't do New York City, did Lake Placid. That's where the Miracle on Ice took place in the background in the 1980 Olympics. And this was a speed skate. Uh, um, track here. Uh, four and a half hours is what, I, for years, I, that was my time. I just didn't, just did four and a half, didn't matter where or why, I, I have no idea, but that isn't anymore. I can't quite do that anymore. But at any rate, I had a friend with us, and he wasn't coming in, so I rested up for about 45 minutes and went out and get him. They had a six hour limit, so I was hoping, if it will come, there it is. There he is, 5.58 and 18 <laughs> seconds, not a lot of time left over. I think they would have given him his medal anyway, but nevertheless, he made it. Uh, California did San Luis Obispo, uh, the coastal range. This was known as the Madonna Ranch, no relation to the um, entertainer. Uh, that was race headquarters. Uh, Highway 101 is just off to the side here, and this was the finish area. Next day, it was a little different coming into the finish. Um, and along the race course, it was all wine, uh, wineries and um, dairy farms. It was quite a mixture, but uh, yeah, it was a neat, neat event. Good weather for it. Does anyone know what state this might be in? Any idea? Ocean? Michigan, Michigan further west. It, it's Hawaii. It's Maui. Uh, that's the day it got up to 95 degrees. It's halfway through, the Maui Mountains are off to the side. At the start, the Japanese travel agency actually put on the race, and we, they had to do their national anthem before ours, but that's still part of the deal. At any rate, they lined us up, and before we could get going, a car ran in right into the um, pack of runners, and, and only one volunteer ended up on the hood and was slightly injured, and everyone else was able to get out of the way. He was drunk, and they charged him $1,200, and that was the end of it. So, Nevertheless, it was a tough day, but we got there, and my friend and I, and um, before I left Hawaii, had to try this. You notice they attached the board to my ankle? I don't think they trusted me. 
Um, this one, this is Texas, not Houston, not Dallas. This is in a place called Gruen, a little um, tourist town. Willie Nelson likes it, and then we'll go there. But at any rate, um, there were about 180 in it, and um, I came in and actually uh, finished uh, on top in my division and set a record in, my, in the 60-year-olds uh, by 20 minutes. It lasted one year, but I've got my record, and <laughs> I got my record, and there's, there's my medal, and me with it. In fact, they didn't, didn't even know if someone my age would be in yet, and they weren't, I had to ask for it. Uh, this guy, quadriplegic, didn't take care of himself with diabetes, and he had a goal of raising enough money for a thousand goats for grandmothers in Zambia, Africa. Uh, AIDS had taken the mothers, and the grandmothers were tra uh, trying to take care of the kids, and this is his way of helping out. So we started a race called George's Goats for Grandmas. This is George. And with our help, and he, they would roll them out each day for the, each um, race day, and he would a big smile on his face. And uh, we raised enough for 2,000 goats, and we also put on five uh, water wells we put in, and still going. George isn't with us anymore, but the race is still going. This is a distant relative. I think you probably know who that is. Uh, he made the statement, in the end, it's not your years that, of life that count. It's the life in your years. Probably worth mention. Now we go on to Canada. Um, ten provinces. I don't think I'll go prove that I can name them all, but they're, they're there. And I did each one of them. Uh, Klondike, very important to us in our history as well as to the Canadians. Kind of brought us together in one way or another. It is said that 100,000 Klondikers tried to make their way up to um, the Yukon. 40,000 made it up there. 4,000 found gold, and a couple hundred got rich. But they say you could ask any one of those Klondikers, and they would say it was the best time of their life. Uh, and then I have on the bottom, you, when you are driven, it's about your, the journey your friends understand. So I thought I had something in common with the Klondikers to a bit there. Um, in Ontario, Thunder Bay, I did the Sleeping Giant Marathon. We started and ended uh, on the shoreline over towards the Sleeping Giant. Uh, the, the Indians have a, a story about him, that it's their, their um, spirit, Nanabazoo, and uh, he w was able to stop Paul Bunyan from chopping down all the trees, but when he heard about the Silver Inlet Mine north of Thunder Bay, he couldn't handle it, so he went out in Lake Superior and turned stone. So that's their story. Um, switch of direction. There will be history in here. This is for Manitoba's um, marathon. Manitoba is not, was not started like most provinces or states. A uh, minority group called the Métis started it because they had a colony where the Anna, uh, Cinnaboyne River met the Red River where Winnebag or Win Winnipeg is today. And uh, so they asked if they could start the province, and uh, John A. McDonald says yes. So they did, but they did, things didn't work out too good, so they moved on. But I did the marathon in Winnipeg, and it rained. And it rained for all four and a half hours of the race. You can even see the water splashing a bit. Continued to rain near the finish, but we got there. Now as for the Mati, the, that group I was talking about, when they moved out of Manitoba, they went to Saskatchewan. And this was their leader. His name was Gabriel Dumont. And uh, the, they couldn't get along with the Canadian government again. They had their rules for the buffalo hunt. And um, some other uh, uh, Canadians wouldn't obey their rules, so they got into it. The Canadians sent an army of 900 up there to tell the, the uh, Métis that you, you can't have your own rules. Well, a little bit, uh, the only war in Canada's history took place. And it started out good for the Métis. That same guy, he had a ferry service, and he just pulled the rope tight across the South Saskatchewan River when the Canadian's uh, steamboat came up, pulled the, the smokestack off, started on fire, and those guys just floated helplessly down the river. Um, and then they had more problems. They started an attack on the Métis, so they're coming from two sides, but the wind was so strong they couldn't hear when one was firing, couldn't coordinate their attack, so the General Middleton, he went off and sat down and said, I'm, enough of this, I'm going to have lunch. When he did this, the Métis, they wondered what was going on and got up. And the rest of his officers saw something, a chance, so they went and attacked the Métis and beat them right there. Métis, uh, many of them were captured, some were killed, uh, that kind of thing. 
And uh, that was pretty much the end of the battle, Battle of Batash. Now, um, this is the other side of Canada in Nova Scotia. This is where the Acadians lived, uh, the French Canadi Acadians, uh, in the, starting in the 1600s. Great farming land, probably best in Canada. They built a dike around that area. It's called Grand Prix. Um, and then the British came and said, either you swear allegiance to the king, otherwise you're out of here. Well, many were, were expelled. Expulsion was great there, and over a 1,000, I think, had to either go to New Orleans or back to France. Many died. This is where Longfellow's Evangeline came from, this area. And five miles away was the town of Wolfville. I uh, did the Valley Harvest Marathon. This is uh, Canada's um, Thanksgiving weekend, too. It's the first weekend in, in October. Uh, and my goal was I was doing Nova Scotia one weekend, Prince Edward Island the next. I wanted to do them both in under five hours. So first time out. And then this is a town from the, the other side. And this is all part of the Bay of Fundy here, too. So up and down, up to 53 feet. So it's a pretty big um, tide change. And then over, I uh, went over into Prince Edward Island. They took us to the north side of the island. It was raining, snowing, sleeting, and the wind was blowing. So when we started out, the, the uh, waves were crashing in. You didn't know if your next step was going to be in the ocean in your last or what was going to happen. Halfway through the race, it did let up, and I, I finished 4.56. I got under five hours, but not by much. And my wife did the 5K. And this is where Canada got its start in this town of Charlottestown. Uh, they asked the queen if they could become a country in 1867. And she said, sure, it was less, less money for the, for, her, for the United Kingdom. Now, we, we had to uh, ask her grandfather, uh, King George. He said, no, we had to fight him in an eight-year battle. And uh, John A. McDonald and I are having a little discussion about that in Charlottetown. It's a neat city. It was named after King George's wife, by the way. Then I went out west to Alberta. Uh, this is red deer. I like rain. Did you notice that? It happens quite often. Uh, I had a little issue out. It was, by the way, red deer's misnamed. The Europeans saw elk and looked like they're red deer, so that's what they named it, and it stuck. I had a little issue here. I couldn't, uh, my hip was bothering me, and they had a five-hour limit, and I said to the organizer, I don't know if I can get this in, but uh, she said, we'll work with you. But it rained the whole time, and a lot of it was in mud along the Red Deer River, but nevertheless, got it in. Got it in under their time gate, so I felt good about that. And before I left Alberta, I had heard about this black cowboy. His name is John Ware. He started out as a slave down in South Carolina, and he, after the Civil War, he wanted to become a cowboy. So he walked 1,000 miles to Texas, told a, a cattle drive that he w didn't know anything about cowboying, but he wanted to do it. And they hired him, built like a linebacker. He came excellent at it. Made his way into Canada, started his own ranch. That's his um, brand up there. He took one of the nines off. He thought it was too hard on the cattle. Uh, built his old log cabin. Uh, got the logs. He heard about a, a sawmill that was flooded up river, and he pulled the logs out when they made their way down and built his cabin out of it. So, quite an uh, energetic guy. Uh, this is my New Brunswick, New Brunswick marathon. Have you heard of Campobello Island? Okay, this is Campobello Island. That's Lubbock, Maine in the background. Um, we had to get permission to cross the International Bridge. We ran for five miles in Lubbock before crossing the bridge. And then we came up on this place. If you heard of it, you probably, yep. Franklin Roosevelt's uh, summer home. Um, his mother bought it for him for 5000 at the time, which was a pretty big deal. And this is where he ended up with polio, too. Nevertheless, me running on it and then coming back into Lubbock, uh, the announcer says, here comes 60-some-year-old Jim Anderson, and Chris is right behind him. Well, I wasn't going to let Chris pass me, so I took off at the finish, and uh, I kind of collapsed afterward. They had to give me an IV, but a half an hour later, I was going again. And never learned my lesson. And this is an area, and a little bit of history again, uh, the border between Maine and New Brunswick was never settled in the Revolutionary War. So it was great uh, timber area, so there was a dispute over who owned what, who could log where. So you get this kind of talk back and forth. This is Canadian land, you swamp Yankees. Go wind to your dandy President Van Buren. And then uh, uh, they come back with, get off U.S. land, you maple-sucking slime. Go to your ugly Queen Victoria. 
And with this, on, at Battle of Caribou, on a, a December night, of all things, a bear was out. I don't know about the cubs, but at any rate, the bear attacked two of the Canadian loggers and they had to shoot the bear. Is when the shots were heard, both sides went back to their governor or president. And you notice where it says pork and beans war up there. 10,000 troops came from both sides and met at where the border should be in their mind. And there was going to be a the war, and not a shot was fired. Winfield Scott was our general at the time. And he talked to Governor Harvey and says, hey, let's put this in the hands of Lord Ashburton and Daniel Webster and settle this thing without anyone getting killed. And they did, and the, the border is as they decided it should be. Uh, 33 guys did die of exposure up there, but that was, that was it. Uh, the only walled city that is lived in, I think it's fair to say, in America, Quebec, uh, and our marathon would run around the outside of that. Uh, this is the Frontenac Hotel, and down here, when Louis, uh, Samuel D. Champlain, this is the part he settled first. And here I am coming to the finish. Had a little issue here, didn't speak French. It took a year of it, but couldn't speak it. At any rate, I got on the wrong side of the fence, but I got back and all worked well. And before we left uh, Quebec, I had to go and look at this. This was the uh, Canadian version of the changing of the guard. It is in French. And that goat there, his name is Baptiste, was given by Queen Elizabeth in honor of the Canadian uh, veterans of World Wars I and II that fought bravely on, on our side. So, yeah. And then this is St. John's in Newfoundland. The Grand Bank Banks are right out there. That hill with the building on, that's Signal Hill. That's where Marconi received the first cross-Atlantic uh, um, radio signal. We're also closer to Ireland here than we are to the Rocky Mountains. And they had a pretty neat uh, marathon, went twice through the city. Uh, and I did, yeah, got it done. And then afterwards, my wife and I went up on Signal Hill and looked back down. So it all worked well. And this is the other side of the country, Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, pretty good sized marathon. And taking off, I was in the pack. And then this is uh, Stanley Park, named after Lord Stanley uh, of the hockey, of the hockey cup, um, same guy. In the background here, if I can, see, there's a little island actually, right in there, called Dead Man's Island. Uh, the Salish Indians had a big battle there, several were buried there. Later, the smallpox epidemic hit in Vancouver and the people uh, that had the disease, had to live there till they died, so a lot. And then now today, with all that, and they were buried there, there's a Naval Reserve office, and they say no one goes there at night because it's haunted. So for what that's worth. Okay, now I want that off. This is me finishing the race, a little cockeyed, but I got there. And before we left, we, got a, we found a, a pod of um, killer whales down by the border between Canada and the U.S., so it worked well. Now this is the, the territories, and I mentioned before that I did a nighttime marathon in Cancun. This is one little quick story about that. Uh, I brought 60 bucks with me down from the uh, motel. I thought that should be good. Paid for my bus ride back and was going to eat. And now what I bought at a convenience store, uh -uh. it was looked like normal healthy stuff. Spiced terribly. Couldn't deal with it. So before the race, I asked the um, organizers, any place I can get a decent meal. He pointed across the street. There was a cafeteria there. They would take my credit card, so I ate. When I got back, I didn't have anything, and the bus had left that was to take me back to my motel. Couldn't speak Spanish. Went to the police. They just turned their head on me. Went to a volunteer finally, and he says, well, we'll try to get a, a taxi ride. I said, I spent all my money. So they ended up taking me 11 miles back to my motel don't even know their name, but that was very nice of them. Um, mentioned the Klondike. One of the routes up to the Klondike was the Chilkoop Trail, and it was very steep but shorter. Now, the Canadian Mounties had a rule. Each Klondiker had to carry 1,100 pounds of goods up there to, so they, they would be good for a year. They had to make 30, 40 trips up there to get that done. To convince them, they had that gold-plated machine gun up there to say, hey, either you do or you're going to have a problem. And it apparently worked quite well. Now, the, the other route up there was the White Pass. Uh, this is Skagway, Alaska. 
uh, and they got the railroad. Um, and Skagway's doing well today. Now, Dye is where the Chilkoot Pass started out. They didn't get the railroad, and that's all that's left. And when I did the Yukon Marathon, it was uh, on the it's trail marathon. It, uh, it's supposed to be tough. You always hear this, but it's toughest in America. And it may be, they say they lose a couple people each year. They have to go find them. It's only flagged here and there, so it is a little trick. I found some ladies that knew their way, and I followed them for the first half of the race. Nevertheless, I, I got there. Uh, and they, one guy, uh, I think it was last year, he entered a walking division for the half marathon, and he got into the trail, and a, a bear came out and was um, kind of um, scared him. So he ran back, and they disqualified him for running because he was in the walking division. So the next year he came back and did quite well. But you, you can see a little bit of the trail there. Um, and you could, they, they mentioned that if you don't watch your step, you might end up in the river and you can see why. That bridge there is over what they call Miles Canyon. Over a hundred of the Yukoners' boats went down in that canyon. Um, and it's not so vicious today because the, there's a, a dam at Whitehorse that kind of slows down the water. But in the day, it was pretty tough. And this is a Northwest Territory, it's the capital. Uh, they have something called consensus there. They have to agree 100% on something or it doesn't become <laughs> law. And our, uh, later, uh, they, that works sometimes, sometimes not so much. They only have 33 communities in the, in the territory. One of those communities had trouble with the polar bear. It was um, scaring them terrible. It went down to the legislature and asked for help. They said, we're too busy for that kind of stuff. So they shot the bear itself, skinned it, brought it down, and said, hey, you people wouldn't live to listen to us. So you keep this in front of you so that next time someone asks for help, you come and help them. So that bear's still there today. And this mace, it's called, is what the Speaker of the House is to have in front of him to uh, remember who he's representing. There's a gold ring down here. There's, uh, I think, 33 stones in that, or nuggets, whatever you want to call them. One for each community, and uh, that's what Yellowknife was founded on in 1930. So it's not that old of a town. In fact, it's a town of 19,000. You still have ATVs running right down Main Street, so it, it's got its. Um, and then up here, I am having trouble with this thing. There's there's a stone in this top part for each of the communities, and then up on the to very top, I took a picture into that mirror because I believe there are diamonds up there because that's what they mine there today diamonds. The um, gold kind of faded out. And that's, uh, they had a double figure eight that you had to do to do the rate. And the, the, the signs didn't always match. So I was asking a lot of questions, but I got in there. I actually got in in under five hours. They said it was a kilometer short. and that was, I, didn't, I wasn't complaining. My brother missed one of the loops, but he got his medal. And they gave us a pair of socks for coming so far. Kind of neat. And that's me at the finish. And that, then we, I had to go fishing up here, and we did, on the Great Slave Lake. Not too many people know. It's about 100 to 200 feet deep here, but it gets as much as 2,014 feet deep in one spot. So it's, it's a lot of lake. And our guide knew about this eagle. It was on an island, and he knew something wasn't quite right with it, so he was feeding it. So we dropped off some fish there. The eagle took off and made it about a quarter mile, didn't get over four or five feet off the water, and went down, as you see. He said, our guy says, we've got to do something. So he gave me a pair of gloves, uh, my brother the fish net, and we fished him out of the Great Slave Lake. Pretty neat uh, looking bird. Now, there was a problem though. Now it became my job to put him back on, or put her back on her island, and she didn't appreciate that. You see, she's going to take a, a chunk out of me if she possibly can. But we got her back there, and all was good, and we went on fishing, did quite well. You notice the rock. Most of it, everything's rock up there. They don't, there, there isn't. You can't dig very deep there. Let's put it that way. Oh my, we switched direction, didn't we? That, the Great Wall of China. Uh, just a few minutes there, uh, in the film anyway. Uh, Two thousand runners. We had to run for four miles on the Great Wall. We had to run up to it. Then uh, whatever, twenty miles. Uh, no, sixteen miles through the villages, and then back on the Great Wall. You notice I had Theodore Roosevelt's statement up there. See the steps, they varied from a couple inches to a foot and a half. Uh, and then we ran through the communities. 
And when we ran through the communities, I noticed um, this van with uh, a crowd of people behind it, and this one lady very upset. Here we met a funeral procession in the marathon. And, and uh, my and then there, there's a little more of the wall. But my deal was, at that point, I just I, I had been sick on the. I'm making excuses now, but I'm going on the flight over there. I got pretty sick. And I made it to about 20, 21 miles, and I just I had to sit down under a juniper tree and hopefully get it back together. I tried crawling and everything. I could not get it back together, so I couldn't finish that. But then I thought of that lady in the funeral procession, and I says, I better be quiet and be grateful for what I have, and did. Uh, a little bit on cross-country skiing. I don't know if you know about the American Burka Biner. Yeah, I've done that 41 times, so I'm one of the old people. Uh, and that's me 41 years ago. Look the same. <laughs> that's 20 years ago, and that's recently. Let's just put it that way. So it, it's a neat event, and now I'm in it again, 42. Uh, Canada's version of, they have what they call the World Loppet, a uh, big race for each country that has snow. This is theirs. It's outside of Ottawa. It's called the Gatineau. Uh, they also have their own Burka Biner, and you have to carry a 12-pound pack. Uh, it looks like it would look like, but this is an example. You don't have to wear a Vikings um, helmet or anything like that. It's just for show, and they weigh it in at the beginning and at the end, the start of the race. Uh, that's and my chiropractor told me it'd be better for if you put six pounds in the front and six in the back. So that's exactly what I did, and it worked out. And this is an aid station. They have the usual stuff: bananas, oranges, Gatorade, but they also push pickles. You know, everyone, they, I never heard of that before. Yeah, but I, I passed on it. And then there, there's the finish, Packstone Place, and they have a way station there to make sure you didn't cheat along the way. And then I said I'd end up back here at, this is the Badlands in North Dakota. I'm almost done, so give me a, And this is what we had to ride through for 105 miles was the thought. Now, they had a 105-mile race. Then you could enter a 50-mile race and a 25 they had. I was going for the whole thing. You had to finish. You started at 7 in the morning. You had to be finished at 12 at night. It was the thing. You had to wear a headlight. I always take on the big stuff and learn later, but nevertheless, this is the start of it, and up near what was at Watford City. As you see, it is not flat, and it wasn't. Made it into the first aid station, which was 25 miles in. I was dead to the world, but I went on. Uh, I, I made it to 50 miles, but um, I knew that was it. There, one guy tried to go on, and, and he knew he wasn't going to make it. He just couldn't go any further, and he thought he was, he was done. So he tried to call his wife. He couldn't get any reception on his phone. And someone finally found him and brought him back. But he th it, was, it was a very iffy deal. You had to be careful. So the next year I came back. Because I had done 50 miles of it. The next year I came back to do the 50-mile version. It was about 100 degrees and humid. But I made it halfway, and, uh, and, or the first 25. And then I started out again, made it 12 more. So I had 87 miles of this thing done in two years. So I came back one final year. And did the 25 mile, and I had oh, done over 105, but nevertheless, I finished that in 324, so I was good. And that's my story. So that, that's what I have for you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> if anyone's interested in more detail, I have it in my books, um, Discovering America, One Marathon at a Time, and... Uh, Pedal, pole, and pant, Canada and beyond. And all, and I got, uh, like I mentioned before, a medal for each state. You want to take a look at anything? Or if you have a question, does anyone have a question? Or, yes. Well, you told me earlier that you were a school teacher. Yes. So I'm wondering how you, how you worked them together? For every trip that you went, especially China, that can't have been uh, inexpensive. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, and every, every state, you make a good point, and you, and you look for deals. Expedia and I are good friends. Um, yeah, and most of them are flights, obviously. So I do four a year. I do one in the spring, and I had to get time off from teaching to do that. Two in the summer, and one in the fall. Look for deals. Uh, my wife works, too. And, and it, it, like I say, that was 50 trips, and then, uh, then Canada was after that. So. Yeah, I just worked it out, and uh, it didn't break us. I, I don't know how to and say And you never had a sponsor? No, no, no. The most I ever won in a race was in the Yukon. I, I was second place in my division, and I think they gave me 30 bucks. 
So I spent it before I went home. Yeah. Yes. Are you from Wisconsin? I'm from yeah, north of yeah, Cable, uh, Hayward Cable area. Yeah, where the Burka Biner is. Yeah. I started that first, and then we watched Grandma's Marathon on the TV and says we've got to try that. So I did, and I've been at it ever since. Yes. How old were you when you started? Uh, Marathons. Early to mid. I want to say 33, 34. I didn't. I was late. I, I didn't, in high school, I was not a runner. Uh, when I was a junior, I had uh, spinal meningitis, and the doctor, for some reason, told me, you'll never run again. Well, that was enough to get me going right there. So, yeah, whatever. I kept that. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes? Oh, I thought about it. I think about it regularly. It's a mat they, they have qualifying times. And you know, I mentioned that one where I set the record. Mm -hmm. I was six minutes. I, I had four, what did I have on that? Four hours, or 401, something like that. 406, and I needed 401. That was it. So I was that close to qualify. You have to qualify for that thing. Mm -hmm. And they keep changing it, which doesn't make it easy either. So I have never quite made it. I did one, uh, I can't remember. It was uh, in a different one in, in uh, Massachusetts. So, but I got all the states, yeah. Yes? Did you ever do Big Sur? No, I did San Luis Obispo, and someday maybe. Yeah. But I, and that, that one, you have to, there's a waiting list, so you have to get in ahead, which, which I deal with, but yeah. My no, granddaughter I, ran that. She did. And she said she didn't realize how big the hills were. Yeah, they're... they're <laughs> kind of, you know, gradual, but yeah. she said, they're not so gradual. When no, you're not running. when you're running. You oh. notice every little up and down. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Yes? Uh, where'd you run in Montana? In Helena. Um, I remember the name. Um, yeah, uh, we had to run over two mountain passes, as I recall. Does that make sense? Yeah, Governor's Cup. Governor's that's what. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My four, four thirty, four forty something. It's just, I just, I was kind of a gift that I could do that for. So now I look back and think, hey. <laughs> yes. What's your training like now? Um, I, I use a statement. It's a lifestyle, and always has been. I, I, you know, I'm, I bike, I ski, and I run, and, and I mix them up, um, and I still do. Uh, I, I don't run a lot, uh, five to eight hundred miles a year, which may, I don't know what that sounds like, but that's what I've done. And then I ski like uh, th uh, 500 to 1,000 kilometers, and I bike uh, around 1,000 miles, and that seems to keep me, and then I cut, split my own wood, you know, I do this other stuff, too. You know? <coughs> Anyway, that's what I do. Wow. I call it a lifestyle. Yes? And was it the Marine Corps Marathon you ran in D.C.? No, no, it was, what did he call I got it right, see, I didn't know it was. <laughs> it was um, the rock and roll. Uh -huh. But every time you turn the corner, you, it seems like you could see the White House or Washington Monument. Yeah. But you didn't have to finish it, the Iwo Jima, or up Arlington Center. I think the Marine Corps Marathon, um, the last mile is uphill. Oh. No, no, this one we finished outside RFK uh, Stadium. Yeah. Uh, they're all the same, and you know how they got, it's not just 26 miles, it's 26 and two tenths. You know where the two tenths came from, don't you? Do you? Well, when the, Mer when the Olympics were in London, they had it set up for 26 miles, but then the king wanted to come, I think this is around 1900, wanted to come and see it. They set up where he was going to sit two tenths of a mile further down the road, oh. and it stuck. Yeah. No, I probably that was kind of a fast way to tell that story, but then you get the idea. <laughs> so where did it originate? The marathon that's in Greece, right? Yeah. Was it a, a distance between a couple cities, or what? Yeah, there's a story. I I got it. Nevertheless, there's, there's a story behind it that uh, the, uh, the people from Sparta were fighting, was it the Persians? And they had to run a message back, and the guy had to run it twice, and, and then, I'm, I'm getting this a little mixed, it's a basic idea. And he, when he made it back, it was 26 miles, oh, okay. and he keeled over when he finally made his last uh, stop. He got the message, but that was it.
So do take a look at stuff. This, it's free to look, so just take a look and if anything interests you. Oh, I, I, I got Australia. I'm taking too much time. No, not at all. Okay. Uh, I was in Australia last year about this time. And um, they were having big grass fights and such. But nevertheless, I did a marathon on the Sunshine Coast one week there. Learned how to drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> Starting in Sydney, downtown Sydney, with a red sport. They, they set me up. Nevertheless, <laughs> I made it. And then we, they have the Australian Alps down there in the southern, down by Melbourne. Went down there the next week and, and uh, did their ski race, the Kangaroo Hoppet. Uh, 42 Ks up in the high country. They had a good two feet of snow up there. But it never gets real cold, so their snow, you know, it's dependent very much. And then the third week, went over to New Zealand. We looked at that a little bit. Then a place called Snow Farm up in their mountains, and they did their ski marathon. Did pretty good in that one. The other one went a little slower, but nevertheless, yeah. So, always finding new things. And this last spring was in Iceland and did theirs. Now I'm going to Scotland. I was going to say, have you ever been to Europe because you didn't mention Iceland is close as I did there. Now I'm going to Scotland. Getting closer. Depends what you call Europe. Do they have marathons, you know, in the other part of Europe? Yeah, Europe has both running marathons and ski marathons. So I plan on going for both if I can. So whatever, whatever God allows me to do. Yeah. Well, I will say that we have copies of Mr. Anderson's book upstairs for checkout. I did not bring them down because, of course, we're hoping that you'll purchase a copy for your own library. But uh, feel free to go up and see all of the yep. items that he brought with him and ask further questions if you want. But thank you so much. You're